So at the moment, we have basically the Friedman equation. Oh, let me no. initiate somehow the pointer. Uh, I realized I have the tendency to basically show you something without having a pointer. It's of course for you quite annoying, a nuisance and a bit of guesswork. So the Friedman equation to summarize, we have there the Hubble constant describing the inflation of the universe. And this is equal, so it's basically linked to the curvature of space. The total energy density of space and something that Einstein introduced just in case there is some no other steady state universe or something is going on that is not taken into account by the other two terms. Well, for, for Einstein, that would have been zero. But obviously, and if you remember Einstein's field equation, then we had the, the geometry, so the curvature of space, that equaled somehow the energy density. And then plus this uh, cosmological term. And now we have, thanks to Friedman, or Friedman, also this inflation, inflating universe, but obviously that is based on ideas that also Lemaitre had. So when you remember Einstein's uh, <laughs> the biggest blunder of his life. So this equation is basically capable to describe this observation that we had. A very fast inflating universe, which then uh, slows drastically down because the universe is small, everything is close together, the energy density is together, the gravity plays a crucial role in slowing down the expansion. It still expands, but less fast than before. Oh, and then this observation from this type 1 uh, supernova, type 1 ace, that the universe expands again, accelerated. Yet, there at the moment uh, also discussions going on whether the supernova type 1a always produce the same amount of flood. Because you have seen there was this set over a, the proton over mass number. And this is for heavy nuclei reduced. So this in this luminosity, when they explode, explosion happens is standard seca mass and therefore how much fuel is there and that since all fuel is used in this type 1a supernova it might be that, that they were brighter in the old days were less heavy nuclear available and they are nowadays less, less bright and that might be the explanation but there are discussions going on but what we want now to look at is what I think the strongest proof for an inflating universe and the Big Bang. What means inflating universe, if we go back, everything was in one, one point, right? highly symmetric, and only quantum fluctuations basically broke the symmetry. In fact, every quantum system doesn't like symmetries. It will do everything it can if necessary, it will spontaneously break symmetries by rearranging itself in order to get rid of what we call degeneracies, that everything is at the same energy. Oh. So then the inflation, we need the LHC, we have the, this uh, very high energy density, what means that the electrons are not attached to the... Uh, to the atoms. We have ions, we have electrons, we have this soup of charged particles, which is called a plasma. So, with light that is, is there in a, with charged part, interacts with charged particles, it couples to the electric charge. 
the scattering process that happens there is con oh there are constantly scattering processes happening Tom scattering Rayleigh Ah, oh, Rayleigh it's not possible that we need something that is polarizable if the energy of the photon is high enough Compton scattering and all this stuff so light is basically constant going around if the density is high enough you will go in circles so and we call this a light dominated universe there were in fact there were for every uh particle there were so many uh photons available is still the case it's just that the photon energy is now much much less because the universe expanded and we're going to see what happens blue shift uh red shift the photons basically lose energy in fact, every cubic centimeter is assumed to, help, to host about 300 to 400 of these uh, cosmic microwave background photons. But then think about the vastness of space. It's quite some number. So, we talk here also about the era of nuclei. And then at some point, at a temperature of about 3000 Kelvin, so the universe expands, it cools down while expanding. At a certain temperature, there is something happening, what we call recombination. This, this soup of, of, of nuclei, so here probably protons, the red stuff, that means hydrogen nuclei, then we have here helium nuclei, mostly helium-4. It's two protons, two neutrons. And then we have these electrons. The same number as both protons, we should have an electrons. This is what we assume that charge itself, the universe is basically neutral. Therefore, we need the same amount as positive charge in protons as well as negative charge in electrons. No, if the temperature is low, is, is high, every time an electron and a, a nucleus come together to, to stick to each other, some light particle is coming along with sufficient energy to, make, to, to let them uh, dissociate. But now at 3000 Kelvin, which corresponds to kinetic energy, this is something I forgot so far. Well, in molecular gas theory, so theory developed by loads of people, but one big name is Ludwig Boltz. Boltz, uh, Boltz is a bolt, but also uh, to as as verb we would call it kicking the ball around. Oh, the kicking the ball around man before football was invented. Ludwig Boltzmann, he basically made an equi energy equivalent of a uh, 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 temperature towards other energies. And then it turned out that he has basically an energy equivalent. Oops, it is more to writing. And so that up KB times the temperature where KB that is what is called the Boltzmann constant. Well, it turns out that this is basically an energy. And now energies we would give always in this electron volts. Why? Because this is then when we have that we have reasonable numbers when we deal with atoms and nuclei. So if you remember that's this very minuscule amount of energy that an electron gets that is accelerated for a distance of one meter with one volt. An electron such a small particle, 10 to the minus 19 coulomb. 
if you remember an ampere is a coulomb per second, yeah. 10 to the 19 electrons fl flowing through a, I think a centimeter squared and in one second. Oh, so this is the Boltzmann constant. And now it's quite interesting that one E volt corresponds to a temperature. So if we have one electron accelerated for one meter with one volt, this minuscule amount of energy, this has a thermal energy equivalent of 11,700 Kelvin. Ooh. So if we would express this as temperature, what means the atoms that move around you and hit your so skin, they have a thermal energy of room temperature of 300 Kelvin, or 273 plus maybe 20, so roughly 300 Kelvin. What means this is roughly one over 40 of this thermal. What means around one over 40 electron volts in kinetic energy. So to give you a feeling, this is the thermal energy equivalent. And since we have now 3000 Kelvin, which is roughly a quarter of this, we have roughly a quarter of an electron volt. Where this process is now, or, or participle started at some point, and at some point it was finished. But obviously, this was a, a period of time where the electron. The universe had a certain size, so it cooled down to something where it could start. It was not immediately, so 3000 Kelvin, everything is done. It was before a bit and afterwards a bit. So it's a period of about 20,000 years that we talk about after the Big Bang. Oh, it was 380,000 years after the Big Bang to roughly 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So what is now happening here? Why can it, is it now so cool? Why doesn't the light has any more the, the energy it would require to immediately take an electron away? So going back again to Bohr's atomic model, where we basically had the electrons moving on these orbits, and this here is basically the one that is mostly trapped. And this one is, is far less trapped. This here is, uh, and going out and out of it, basically, they are no longer, almost no, not trapped at all in terms of energies. This would be the energy of the first, of the innermost. So, very in the center is the nucleus. And then comes the electron. And again, I have realized I forgot the laser pointer. So n equal one means we are very, very deep in the hole. And in order to come free, we need to lift the electron all this way up. n equal two. So this radius corresponds to something which is far less deep. Well, this you see or not to scale. You see, this costs us 13.6 electron volts that we need to invest. So light that wants to have this electron that sits in here removed needs to come along with an energy of 13.6 electron volts. Remember temperature 11,700, this is about 140 or 150,000 Kelvin. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I should make a, that I sh uh, shiver, it's rather, that's proper sauna. Well, here, oh, to come from the second level, if the electron would be in the second level, this costs us only 3.4, uh, 3.4 electron volts, yeah. This is about... 
3.4. This is still 40,000 Kelvin. Oh, 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 oh. But compared to 160,000, that's almost cold. So from here, it would be just less than one electron volt and so on. So from these higher levels, it costs us less and less and less. So and why did this happen now? Why it, was it possible beforehand? We talk about temperatures of maybe 4,000, 5,000 Kelvin. Why would, was it possible still that this process that requires basically temperature of 150,000 Kelvin to happen? Where does this light come from? And what light are we talking about? Do you remember this? Uh, this typical line spectra of the hydrogen, so the, the red would end up in the, from the third to the second, and this slight blue or blue green from the fourth to second, from the fifth to the second, and then so on. So obviously, we are dealing in here with something that costs us much more energy than blue light. What is behind blue light, violet, and then comes the ultraviolet. Very energy red. Maybe even going over to X-rays. This hard radiation that we don't want to be exposed too much to. Okay, so so basically, if an electron and a, a, a proton meet from infinity to close there we would get energy free of 13.6 a watt in order to divide them we need light we need to invest some energy to lift the electron from this hole or sink to zero and then the marble can run roll off so we need light that has this 13.6 a watt or we could it's far less likely, a factor 10,000 less likely to go with two steps. So we need UV radiation that is associated with this very high temperatures of 160,000 Kelvin. But we have now only temperatures around this, which corresponds to more of an evolved so 50s. Oh, yo, yo. How can this work out? Well, and then we go back to our Planck spectrum. A temperature corresponds to a Planck distribution of the, of the number of photons with a given wavelength. And therefore, with a given energy, if the wavelength goes here, the energy goes up back to. Means if the wavelength goes in this direction, means the energy goes in this direction. By the way, that's uh, something I learned the hard way. I was asked in an exam about this. Oh. You might not be jealous, I had only eight exams in order to get my diploma, but corresponds to a master degree. Well, but they were then uh, going over three, four semesters in one gift subject. And in one of them, in my pre-diploma, which Another exam was about four semesters. I was asked basically, or I had something like this, and then I was asked, where is then the energy going? And oh, after an hour, almost an hour of examination, I didn't got it. So I ended up with a B minus PD, but can live with it. So, but. What means we have now the energy is going here, the wavelength is going this, it's becoming longer and longer. The colder it becomes, the, the longer the wavelength in energy. And here is not usually the spectral emitted power. Oh, 
if we go now back and take the light field that, that comes out from the black body, and then we do it like a chef, we take a big knife, and take the light field and chop it into its individual small pieces that we could call photon, and then every photon has its own wavelengths. So we, this here corresponds to the, uh, the y-axis corresponds basically to the number of photons with a given wavelength. This is something that is nice. I can, I have, uh, I like to count the discrete steps. So, okay. And what we now see that if we have a given temperature that exceeds 3000 Kelvin, this Planck distribution has always here on the high energy side something left. So let's say this is the, the stuff that we need to, to ionize. So let it be. So often this 5000 Kelvin, there's obviously clearly a lot of photons there that are still able to do it. And atom forms and immediately one of these photons comes along and says, no, 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 you are not supposed to be formed. Okay, so immediately done, dissociation. Now, if we look at 4000 Kelvin, we see here we have still this tail. Again, atom forms and relatively quickly one of these photons comes along and as you are not supposed to be here. But now, at 3000 Kelvin, his tail is essentially gone. There are no photons there anymore that could directly dissociate the atom. Ha! Ah. And at this time, obviously it's possible that proton, electron, meet, produce one of these 13.7 kV photons, but compared to the overall number, that's, that's negligible. Oh, and then we have a period where basically all protons are, have now met with, with electrons or helium and nuclear with two protons in the nucleus, so two times charge, two electrons, so that the compound becomes electrically neutral. And now the, the scattering processes that happen are different. This is basically, it just changes a bit the direction of the light, but anyway, the universe is then also bigger and the soup gets thinner and that light is now capable to propagate freely through space. Okay, so this is basically what happens here. And since these photons are traveled since this time, if we know here, at this time, oops, if we know basically put here our detector, we get the planks or we get a photograph from the universe at the very beginning of time. Then we are back to, oh, not to forget the laser point again, stupid me. We are back to this type of photograph. Oh, ho, ho, ho. And this corresponds to the time when the electrons and the protons and then the photons were also no longer, they were just propagating. Okay. Yet, there are few microwaves nowadays. Oh. We have here a temperature of 3000 Kelvin where this happens. So basically, here suddenly this UV part, this hard light that can destroy molecules and then detach electrons from, the, from their atoms, this is gone. And now we talk here about 3000 Kelvin. If we send astronauts into space, do they have to shield against heat radiation with 3000 Kelvin? No. It turns out that 
the microwave background is about 2.7 Kelvin. So the, this is where the Planck spectrum basically has its maximum. Then we can apply this Wien's law. At the maximum, the wavelengths where this Planck distribution has its maximum, this type, type of stuff, corresponds to a temperature. What nonsense do I talk to you? I say we, we observe light that corresponds basically to 2.7 Kelvin, so something that is very cold, so minus 270 degrees Celsius. And on the other side, I tell you this comes from about 3000 Kelvin. What can happen in between? Well, we have here this very, very 3000 Kelvin, where we have already good, it's reddish, but but we talk now about something in the spectrum that is far, far more long wave. What can happen? Well, this light was produced, it's traveling since then through space. But what happens? Space has grown underneath it. So we take basically up to We have basically now this blue where it's emitted, and now space grows and the wave becomes longer and longer. So it's this rubber sheet, make a wave on, and now we pull. What happens? The wavelengths, the, the, the entire stuff expands, and this wavelength is, seems now to be expanded. or uh, is now expanded because underneath the stuff has grown. Oh, or, well, you make a tattoo when you are young and skinny, and then uh, when, you, when you're my age and my size, then what happened to the tattoo? <laughs> because the skin underneath expands. Oh. Okay. So we can now basically look in this expansion and roughly with forgetting about the minus one. Well, 3000 divided by 2000, uh, by 2.728 Kelvin corresponds to a redshift of 11,000. Oh, 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 oh. This is the factor basically about which the universe has grown compared to this uh, 380,000, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, when the photons were suddenly able to propagate freely through space. It's quite something, isn't it? Okay, now, if we look into space, so we are going back to Penzias and Wills, which is basically here on top. This Penzias and Wills and what they have seen back in the 60s. Oh, again, sorry, stupid me. A laser point on, hopefully you see it. Penzias, Wilson, the home antenna, then they look into space. And what they see is very uniform everywhere, the same radio, the same background. Of course, then you see here this band, what will it be? Something that is nearby our Milky Way. Okay. So the picture stays well for the next 27 seven years until the Kobe satellite, satellite started to operate. And Kobe is, means Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer. And I remember that uh, when I was a student, undergraduate student, my university was hosting a small conference and there was one talk about this and I wondered why, because it was nuclear physics and then suddenly this kind of stuff. You often, if you have something very important going on, you invite this people. And then the guy was coming and then everybody in the, in the audience, in the lecture hall, oh, oh, ooh. 
What we see here again is this red band that corresponds to the uh, Milky Way. So we are now making these pictures that Northern Hemisphere is basically above the, or what we would think is above the Milky Way. And the other stuff is uh, below. So in terms of our, our equator, this is something going uh, this way through. So here's something diagonal, which is subtwisted. Okay, and now. Oops. So in what we have seen, if we look at a bit more detail, it's no longer uniform. What we look at, if we look at temperature difference of a thousands of a Kelvin, I'm talking about a thousands of a Kelvin. So here, this blank spectrum of the universe has, has nicely a maximum of 2.728 Kelvin. That's how cold it is in, the, in space. But now we see, if we look at the deep, Deeper scale of about thousands of, no, no, thousands of, a couple of millions of Kelvin differences. So this year is now less than a couple of millions of Kelvin less, and the red stuff is, is then hot. Then suddenly something happened that this structure appeared that should not be there. It should have been nicely uniform. Unless there is something which made clusters of matter. Clusters of matter in this in this very primordial soup before this decoupling happens. But that shouldn't be because light has a pressure. And because we have so many light particles that should have every time you have an accumulation, there is a, it's basically so much light coming that it's pushed apart and you had nicely uniformly distributed this soup of particles that interact with light. Okay, so there is something that we want to explore. That we might call now dark matter. Now then, because it, this was such a sensation, immediately next billion pound on the table, we need a better satellite. And that was the WMAP, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. So 2003, it's, it was basically collecting data, and then 2004, 2005, it was publishing. It was a bit unlucky for me, or lucky, depends on what you want, because this was when a had my PhD and PhD exam in Germany means you can be asked everything. Luckily, of course, for me, I knew the guy, the exam, external examiner, they like astronomy, so perfect for me. In the end, W map. And if people are so, so fixed about something, then there must be something important. Okay, so again, looking in this scale, so if we look just at this blank spectrum, nicely uniform is 2.728 Kelvin. That's the temperature of the universe. So this is basically this blank spectrum. And what you see here, the arrow bars had to be inflated by 500 times, a factor of 500 in order that one can see that this, at this time, it was the best measured Planck spectrum, <laughs> and that's basically the Planck spectrum of our universe, of the very early universe. So now if we look at delta T of millikelvin, three millikelvin, three and a bit, what do we see? <laughs> Seems to be a hotter spot and a cooler spot. Where can this come from? What you see there is a Doppler effect because our solar system is moving relative to this cosmic microwave background. What means if we move towards them, they appear a bit blue shifted, hotter. I'm sorry that they are now there. This is now these heat maps. They are always confusing because we associate heat usually with red and blue with cold. 
of course, physics wise, it's an all. Blue shift means there is more energy than previously, <laughs> and red shift is opposite. So towards our what have we have been trained to to be intuitive. That would be now for psychologists something. By the way, cold and hot before the coffee is completely cold. So what we see here, this hotter one is basically everything is blue shifted. This is towards we are moving relative towards the our solar system relative towards the cosmic microwave background. The here way. This is what we call later you're gonna see the dipole mode. Two poles, hot and cold. And then if we look at micro Kelvin, what means delta T 18 micro Kelvin. This is this uh, COVID. Millions of a Kelvin difference. Millions. 18 micro Kelvin hotter, 18 micro Kelvin cooler. That's what's up. <laughs> yeah. Well, and because it was so important, this picture, as I said, we can immediately plug a uh, W map and you see a difference in resolution. So this dark spot is still dark, this dark is dark, but we see now a finer freckle size or a finer size of the picture of the resolution. And then we can compare this. Sorry for this. Uh, this picture is obviously before the Me Too movement. This beautiful lady, the picture of it with the Kobe resolution. So we, we see there is something. This W map resolution. So it's another billion. And, oh. <laughs> okay, so we see there is very likely a lady. But this might be the, the arc of doorway. Of course, and because it was important, <laughs> and people, Kobe was now confirmed, we needed a much, much better detailed, more detailed look to see really what it is. Another billion on the table, or it was or shot into space. This was in, in honor of Max Planck, the Planck set. So the Milkins and microwave, anisotropy broke down your map, and then Planck. By the way, Kobe, what do you associate with Kobe? Exactly, the steaks, uh, one steak costs a couple of hundred dollars, <laughs> pounds. It's Kobe uh, beef, you know, the massage there, the, 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 the cattle and so on. And my generation associates the, uh, a bad earthquake. Well, a lot of this highway collapsed. And, in Japan. Oh. Okay, but obviously the evolution of satellites and the evolution of, oh, of uh, 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 how to say, of uh, resolution. And we, here you see it in terms of freckle size, so Kobe, W map, and then Planck. Really a uh, nice downy to very small scale and now we could associate since this here what you see is basically the the cosmos around us and then sliced open and made flat oh, this freckle size seems to matter but we come back later now i can introduce use this plank this was together started together with another one herschel which was there for uh, searching for planets, exoplanets, planets around uh, other solar systems, in other solar systems. And was quite successful, I think it found a couple of thousand. Okay, and it was positioned in what we call the Lagrange point two. It's now quite busy there because seemingly everybody <laughs> seems to like to send there. Uh, satellites to Lagrange point two. The Lagrange point 
one, which is one and a half million kilometers away, but means one percent of the distance Earth to Sun. Well, what is the Lagrange point one? If we send a spacecraft into space and position it geostationary, what means always about the same point of the Earth, that uh, not about not geostationary, always at the same point between the on the connection line between Sun to Earth. If it's close to Earth, it because of this one over R squared in Newton's law. It sees mostly the gravity of the Earth, and is, which is a bit reduced because there is already gravity towards the Sun working. If we go away, this is obviously that the influence of the Sun becomes larger and the one of the Earth drops. It becomes basically light. We would go towards the Sun. Obviously, the Sun is much more dominant and, and it feels this net towards the Sun, but still a bit towards the Earth. And now we could go along this, this connection line to the point where there is no net force, neither to, where this, the net force to the sun equals the net force towards the earth. That means there's zero gravity. That's the super point. That's the Lagrangian point one, named after this French mathematician physicist Lagrange. Who work together with Euler. This is a very nice example. Euler was already a famous mathematician, and then this young French lad, lad came along and they derived some equations. And seemingly Euler had these equations already, but he said, Then I have my big name. You go ahead. Well, if you have something like pi with E, Euler's number named after you, then you don't need much more. So he was very generous and let this young man. This is how the Lagrange equations, which is a complete different approach to, to mechanics than Newton. Much more elegant. Okay, but obviously there is somewhere this point, Lagrange in one, but no gravity. This would be perfect for satellites. You don't need much fuel, etc. And similar stable conditions you find in this Lagrangian too, not as good, but at least stable in terms of gravity, it's always the same. That's why this is so nice to, to send satellites there. The problem is if you send it towards the sun side. Here you get a bit of shadow from the Earth. Because if you want to measure something that is so microwaves, that is so temperature dependent, Every fluctuation from the sun might change in the temperature in your instrument. So you want to have it in the shadow. On the other hand, shadow means uh, you don't get uh, what you have here on the bottom are, of course, solar panels. So you want, of course, uh, also power. But you want to have this very stable in terms of thermal and in terms of gravity conditions. And the nice thing is, when you now have half a year, you rotate basically once half around the, the night. And then you have this, this satellite rotating around its own axis. What means you can, with your scientific instrument, make one slice. But now, while the system moves on, the slice moves continuously. And within half a year, you map once the night sky. That's a nice thing from your Lagrangian point two. And this is nicely shown here in this video. So please stop this and then you see basically Planck on this uh, uh, way at, at the, the Lagrangian point two, so this L2, scanning the night sky. <laughs> Okay, this is um, to get the background, the cosmic microwave background of the entire night sky. And you do this for a couple of years. So not only once the statistics, you double, triple, quadruple the statistics. 
Boah. But it's a good idea. Well, oh, only slice 49 for 90. I need to speed up a bit. Sorry about this, but I think it's now also good uh, to stop this video. On the other hand, you always have the chance to, to stop these videos and come them back and maybe take a look on the couple of slides before to, to remember where, where we were. But on the other hand, yeah. For me, it's time to get up and, and stretch my back. I'll see you in a few minutes after you hopefully have seen this video.